And you're going to start out doing a number of written protocols and where you place things on the page as you do free flow of consciousness with your thought processes, just going on the page, not worrying about what is the target? Am I going to get this right? You know, and that those kinds of thoughts, of course, everyone has them, but we have a number of techniques to help people set those thoughts aside and just let free flow of consciousness happen onto the paper. Everything goes through the body. So this is all based on the mechanics of how the conscious and subconscious mind work through the body. So um, we really like to have everything based in the scientific method that utilizes the understanding of how the brain functions, the right and left brain interaction, and the conscious and subconscious interaction, which is the key to controlled remote viewing. So we, we have movement commands and we have action cues. Movement commands always begin with the word move. So we never say like go to blah, blah, blah. We always say move. And even when we're talking about non-tangible things like move to the relationship between the biological and the man-made and describe. So you're moving to a relationship, how things relate to each other. Different viewers experience their perceptions in different ways and viewers have strengths and weaknesses. So some viewers, for example, might say, oh my gosh, I totally smelled a very strong smell of smoke at the target. But do they actually smell smoke or are they just kind of, it, it's almost like a memory of the way smoke smells. Hello everyone and welcome back to Chasing Consciousness. So today we have the extraordinary phenomenon of controlled remote viewing to get our heads around. Thanks to the declassification of US government documents and several Freedom of Information Act requests, enough official paperwork about the top secret Stargate remote viewing program has been gathered to give credibility to a new documentary film about this controversial psychic phenomena. The film Third Eye Spies follows laser physicist Russell Targ, who, along with Hal Puthoff, was employed by the Defense Intelligence Agency to do some tests on allegedly psychic test subjects at the Stanford Research Institute in the early 1970s. This was at the height of the Cold War, when intelligence was coming out of Russia that the military were doing psychic research successfully. So to cut a long story short, the experiments were successful, and the program went top secret shortly after the scientists published their first results. And a protocol for viewing in the mind's eye, distant places and times was developed by their first talented subject, Ingo Swan. Now, the program ran for over 20 years, costing over $5 million of military funding, uh, which is actually very little for military projects. The technique was used for intelligence work for the CIA, the DIA, and the NSA, and included the assisting of finding lost aircraft and profiling of Russian bases before being declassified after a CIA report determined that the technique wasn't accurate enough, despite getting some good statistically significant results. After it was declassified, the instructors went over to the private sector and they began teaching the technique to members of the general public. Two such instructors were Lynn Buchanan and Mel Riley, who met my guest today, Laurie Williams, and became her mentors. Now, in 2001, Laurie became the first non-military certified instructor. Her experience includes not only teaching the technique, but working with law enforcement to assist in missing persons cases, conducting professional sessions for corporations, and uh, working on archaeological mysteries. She's also the author of two books about the subject, Boundless, how uh, your how-to guide to practical remote viewing, and Monitoring, a guide to remote viewing and professional intuitive teams for anyone who wants to learn a bit more uh, before doing an actual course with an instructor. Now, I'm quite new to this subject, despite its long history, and was at first utterly skeptical. But after studying the data and hearing the accounts of the highly credible scientists involved, I couldn't help but want to speak to a specialist. So I'm just itching to get into the nuts and bolts. So without further ado, let's go. Laurie Williams, hello and welcome to Chasing Consciousness. How are you? I'm doing great, Freddie. Thanks so much for having me. I feel really honored to be here and that we finally connected. 
Now, Laurie, I always like to start by asking my guests about their first conscious reflections when they were young, usually sort of 10, 11, 12. Which thoughts come back to you as the most meaningful from that time? Actually, my earliest reflections were probably when I was like three or four. I remember lying in bed, I could hear music in my head that sounded so beautiful. And I wish there was a way, you know, I remember thinking, how can I get this music out of my head so other people could hear it? And I would have dreams that uh, that were really wild. And I would tell my mother about these dreams. And I don't know what the poor lady thought, but I had some pretty wild dreams of of strange entities coming and taking me out of my body and taking me to classrooms. And these were things that were happening when I was way too young to have that sort of dream, it seems like now as a as an adult looking back and having had children of my own. Uh, and in the dreams, the interesting thing is we communicated telepathically and I didn't even know how to express that. So I'd be, mom, I had these dreams about these beings that came to me. I think they were angels and they we, had, we, we didn't have to talk with our mouths because we could talk with our minds. You know, and this was the one of the earliest memories I have are of, of this sort of thing. And it would just be, you know, and I uh, later I didn't know what to make of that. I, I never have forgotten the dreams. They're still very vivid in my mind. And uh, and they came when I was quite, quite young. I mean, way too young to articulate what was going on, you know. So I found that to be interesting. And then from a very young age, at, at the, around the age of 12, I really started questioning a lot of things. The Vietnam War, um, you know, just questioning why, why are, why do we go to war? You know, why do people fight with each other? And always feeling, having a sense that there had to be more than you could just see and touch, you know, with your eyes and your hands. There had to be something beyond that. But I didn't really understand what that was. But I feel like I've always been a seeker of consciousness from day one. Wow. It's not the first time that that very, very extraordinary experiences at at young ages has come up on the show either. Now, Laurie, let's get into this. In the introduction, I gave a little short intro to the military remote viewing program that lasted from the mid-70s until 1995. Listeners, do check the show notes for um, that story and for the documentary film, as I think it's really valuable background knowledge for what we're going to talk about now, and we'll support everything Laurie will tell us. Um, we're going to do a full episode on that history as well. So I won't ask you to tell that story, Laurie. So being a science podcast, we want to get straight into the nuts and bolts, and then we'll come to some of your extraordinary stories later. Now, I came to this very recently and, of course, was was skeptical, being a, a scientific mind, but I was brought around by the watertight methodology, the the statistical credibility of the data, and the blind nature of the experiments. Although there is a caveat here, listeners, unfortunately, there's a lot of charlatans out there on the internet. So don't get put off if when you Google this, you find some stuff that doesn't look rigorous. We are going to be clarifying what the real practice looks like today with Laurie. So firstly, let's talk about the protocol and the importance of the viewer being blind to the target. Talk us through the technique and and how it's been developed to get the the best results. Okay, this is a great subject. Um, I focus mostly on the military method, which is known as controlled remote viewing or CRV. And remote viewing without the word controlled in front of it is kind of like the term martial arts. You know, it's just too generic. Uh, there's many different types of remote viewing out there from, you know, from Madame Minerva in the gypsy tent to, you know, whatever they, everybody's calling themselves a remote viewer nowadays. So um, we really like to have everything based in the scientific method that utilizes the understanding of how the brain functions, the right and left brain interaction, and the conscious and subconscious interaction, which is the key to controlled remote viewing. So when we set up a target, a target can be anything in all of time and space, but let's say that um, the target was the sinking of the Titanic, which we would never give actually to a, to a, a student, but let's say we had an event like, uh, you know, some event in history, and we wanted to make that a target for a viewer to view, then we would want to be sure that the viewer had no knowledge of what the target was. And so we would ask the viewer, we would simply assign a number to that target, and then we would ask the viewer to start, begin the process. And the process is a step-by-step process. You're sitting at a desk or a table with some clear white paper, you know, regular printer paper, 
and a nice pen. Usually we recommend a gel pen that is black or dark blue. And you're going to start out doing a number of written protocols and where you place things on the page as you do free flow of consciousness with your thought processes, just going on the page, not worrying about what is the target? Am I going to get this right? You know, and that those kinds of thoughts, of course, everyone has them, but we have a number of techniques to help people set those thoughts aside and just let free flow of consciousness happen onto the paper. Everything goes through the body. So this is all based on the mechanics of how the conscious and subconscious mind work through the body. So if you think about it, Freddie, when you're driving somewhere and you just sort of forget which, where you're going and you're just thinking about what am I going to make for dinner tonight? And then you suddenly pull into your up to your house and you go, how did I get here? I don't even remember driving the last few blocks. This is what we're talking about. The body knows what it's supposed to do because it's working with the subconscious. So the subconscious works with the body. The conscious mind works with the body and everything is manifested through the body. So that's the key thing in the military remote viewing method is the knowledge of how conscious and, and subconscious mind interact, utilizing the body as the interface or the interpreter for the information. Okay. And what about the blindness? You mentioned that there is a code that has absolutely nothing to do with the target. Um, why is that so important that they're not that they, they don't know what they're trying to view? Because if you know something, we, we call that pollution. If you're given too much information, it's really hard to avoid the stereotypes. So let's say that I were to tell you, hey, I want you to view a target and the target is a criminal, Freddie. Well, instantly, if I were to ask you right now, what are some adjectives that you think of when you think of criminal? Uh, my students, we, this is an exercise we actually do in my class. And the students come up with things like, you know, dark, uh, swarthy, male, ethnic, um, drug addicted, pockmarked, um, carrying a weapon. You know, they come up with all these stereotypes that we have. But what if the criminal in this case is the little old lady who's worked for the company for 50 years and she's been embezzling? You see, so our, our ideas, of, our stereotypes, our preconceived ideas that we already have locked on to certain nouns, those are the things that will throw us off. If I were to say, oh my gosh, the target is a little girl who got kidnapped this afternoon and thrown into the trunk of a car. And, you know, we need to know how's she doing? What's the car look like? I mean, can you imagine the, the viewer's imagination is going to be all over the place with knowing what the target is. Whereas if you don't give the viewer any information at all, and you just say, you could give them some very generic things. Like let's say we needed a description of the of the kidnapper's car, we could just say the target is man-made. Describe the target. Right. Then they don't it could be anything man-made in all of time and space, right? So it's very generic. It doesn't really pollute them too badly, but it does give them a little bit of focus so that they can go, okay, my goal is to describe a man-made, something man-made. Um, if I were, let's say I needed to know where the child is going to be found and I needed a good description of that location. Then I could just say the target is a location, describe the target and give them a coordinate number. And the coordinate numbers really are designed pretty much just for database facing purposes. If we can, you know, we have a database and we like to keep the, you know, keep track of the targets and, and how viewers are doing in their remote viewing sessions. Okay. And so presumably the risk here is that the conscious mind comes in and as you say, pollutes, or it's sometimes called, I think, an analytical overlay where the information that's coming from my conscious interpretation of the impression can change the way I then go on to view the rest of those impressions. Is that why you you get people into a meditative state? Because I understand there's a sort of, there's the need to kind of be, be quite calm beforehand. Actually, no. <laughs> oh, it's not necessary. No, not with controlled remote viewing. You know, I, I have a student who was quite well known uh, as a psychic and a medium and, and things she had helped. She had worked with the FBI and done all these all many things. And she was well known before she discovered controlled remote viewing. She's taken my basic, intermediate and advanced courses twice each. And those are three day courses. And I asked her, why, why did you take these courses? If you know, you've already, you were well known before this ever started, you were successful. She said, controlled remote viewing taught me that I don't have to be in a meditative state to get information. I don't have to be in perfect circumstances. I can do this anytime, anywhere, 
under any circumstances. So in, in my school, Intuitive Specialists, one of the things we emphasize is that a viewer needs to be resilient and robust and versatile. And so if you're a prima donna who's like, well, I can't, I just can't remove you right now because I don't have my lucky rabbit's foot with me, you know, that kind <laughs> of thing. You know, you know, we we, you know, we don't want viewers like that because they'll be completely useless. We were we were one time at a attending some kind of a conference and there were remote viewers from all over the world from different schools. And there was one group in a, in a corner and they all had like sound blocking things on. And I think they put on eye shades and everything. And then they would, every few minutes, they go, it's too noisy in here. We can't remove you under these circumstances. So I felt really glad that we try to make sure that the remote viewers are exposed to a lot of different circumstances. Uh, when I was learning this, I was a mom with seven kids and a new grandbaby and uh, four nieces and nephews living at the house. And I had a crazy full-time job resettling refugees. And at the same time, I'm trying to learn to become a controlled remote viewer. And uh, and it was always chaos. You know, there were kids climbing the walls and phone calls coming in from the police about some kind of a refugee situation or whatever. And it was just constant stuff. But, um, you know, I just found that I had to grab time whenever I could get it. I would be remote viewing in airports and on buses and, you know, you name it. I was just in dental offices while waiting for the dentist or whatever. And um, I remember one time thinking, oh my gosh, you know, this is so hard. I can't, I, you know, it's taking me a long time to get one session completed. And uh, my mentor said, hey, don't worry. You know, you're going to be very versatile because you've, you've had to learn to remove you in all these different circumstances, you know, with noise and silence, uh, indoors, outdoors, you know, and confusion and chaos. Um, well, that's, so that's very interesting. That's that slightly flies in the face of some of the other uh, reading that I've done, where there's a lot of talk about this sort of fetus state, you know, this moving into a more meditative brainwave before you're able to receive these kind of uh, impressions. But perhaps it's a question of practice. Now, Laurie, onto the phenomena itself. Later, we'll come back to speculate on the nature of this information. How would you describe the impressions that you receive? Uh, as a remote viewer, um, it, it's not like seeing a video in your head, is it? It's it's a bit different. Oh, it's very, very different. Um, and I actually even wrote an article about the difference between, because a lot of people confuse uh, what a controlled remote viewing session might be like compared to, let's say, an out-of-body experience, which several people have, you know, many people have experienced. So I wrote an article about the difference. But when you're sitting at a table with paper and a pen with your eyes open, following a written process, and because we want the body engaged, you're also saying everything that comes into your mind out loud and making sure to write it down somewhere on the paper. So that is that takes some training just to because we've been taught to sit there and shut up, right? Our whole lives. <laughs> hey kids, sit there and shut up. So now, now uh, you know, you're you're suddenly being expected to say every thought that comes into your mind out loud and write it down. And so one of the principal rules we have is write everything down. Everything. You have to write everything down and it helps to say it out loud because this is a physical discipline. So we want to engage our bodies. We want to be listening with our ears, talking with our mouths, you know, utilizing our larynx. Uh, and of course, we're writing everything down. So we're using our hands. And a lot of it is also kinesthetic. We touch certain things to get more information. Um, so it's a very kinesthetic practice. So in that sense, uh, the so impressions are very diverse. The, yes. And the way it feels when an impression is coming in, it's this very, very quick, like the aperture of a camera that opens and shuts just instantly. You know, you can get these almost almost nebulous perceptions that come in. And different viewers experience their perceptions in different ways, and viewers have strengths and weaknesses. So some viewers, for example, might say, oh my gosh, I totally smelled a very strong smell of smoke at the target. And so they're sitting in their office or their den or wherever doing a remote viewing session and suddenly they smell smoke. But do they actually smell smoke or are they just kind of, it, it's almost like a memory of the way smoke smells, if that makes sense. So it feels more like a memory of the way smoke smells rather than actually like, I don't have smoke in my nose. Um, other viewers might taste something like, oh, I, you know, I felt like I was tasting lemons. Were they really tasting lemons or were they experiencing it more like the memory of the way a lemon tastes? So we we experience these things, but the ones that fascinate me the most, Freddie, are the sounds. 
because you can experience a sound at the target that, and you're not actually hearing the sound in your environment, and you're very much aware that you're not hearing the sound in your environment, but it's like a sound in your head, almost like a dream sound, if I could put it that way. And uh, so I'll give you an example. I was working a target, and I thought I was hearing the rotors of a helicopter. So let's say that the rotors of a helicopter sound like, you know, if you were going to write it down, it would be THP, THP, THP. And what the target was, was a flock of birds taking off, a big flock of big birds taking off. So if you think about wings flapping and helicopter rotors, they sound very similar. And uh, there was an example of a remote viewer in the unit viewing um, a race that takes place in very shallow water with long boats that are made for shallow water. And there's a guy in the back of the boat with a stick that he uses to maneuver and steer the boat. There's a guy in the front who's saying whether to go to the right or the left to avoid boulders because the water's filled with boulders. So imagine a race with a bunch of these boats trying to get to the finish line, but they have to maneuver around boulders in these long boats. And the, this whole race took place in South America. The viewer had no knowledge of Spanish whatsoever. And so the viewer says to the monitor, I'm hearing sounds, human voices, and it sounds like they're saying, Recha, Recha, Scareda, Scareda. Well, in Spanish, a la derecha, a la izquierda, means to the right, to the left. So he was literally hearing this. Now you think, oh, that's really cool. So he's picking up sounds from the target. Yeah, what's even cooler, though, is the target is not set in the present moment. The target that he's viewing took place years in the past. So he's not only picking up sounds from the target, he's also time traveling. (laughs) So to me, that just, I, you know, I've been doing this since 1996. Here we are, 2022. So we're, we're coming on 30 years, four more years. It'll be 30 years that I've been involved in control room of viewing and it never ceases to fascinate. Well, you know, with stories like this, I can see why. So once you get the hang of sort of separating these impressions from your own mind's overlay, its own pollution, its own interpretation, are you able to use more spatio-temporal techniques? For example, like, are you able to say, okay, I'm now going to move 100 meters east or or to go back 24 hours in time? It, it, are you able to have that kind of spatio-temporal control? Oh my gosh, yes. We call those movement commands in, in uh, CRV lingo. Um, so we, call, we have movement commands and we have action cues. Movement commands always begin with the word move. So we never say like go to blah, blah, blah. We always say move. And even when we're talking about non-tangible things, like move to the relationship between the biological and the man-made and describe. So you're moving to a relationship, how things relate to each other. Move 10 feet up above the site and describe. Um, Excuse me. Um, I was working a target one time and that was the the location of the target was New York City. And I was asked to move 50 miles north. And I found a dam and, you know, a a beautiful scenic area with fall colors. And I thought, oh, I'm way off. You know, my first thought was, oh, I'm totally off. And actually, it was completely accurate that 50 miles north of the site that I was viewing, there was a dam and these beautiful trees that were all turning colors. And that was viewing in present moment time. In other words, viewing in real time versus viewing an an event that happened in the past. Interesting that you use the word command there. My question that comes up is who's commanding whom? (laughs) Well, these terms, you have to understand, they were developed for the U.S. military. So when it comes to military lingo, command is a really common word in the military. Right. And so when they when they talk about uh, if you were going to say, well, we've got these terms or these cues we want you to use, the cues are named various types of cues. So we have sensory cues, dimensional cues, uh, conceptual cues. We might have what we call people cues. And then we have action words or action, I mean, action commands and movement commands. Mm. And of course, we one thing that we coach people is if you are not viewing by yourself, if you have what we call a monitor, and I actually wrote the only book ever written on monitoring a remote viewing session. And I, I really mentioned just it. it. I mentioned it in the intro. So listeners, <laughs> that will be in the show notes. Anybody who wants to go into this in, in even more depth. 
Well, I just have to say, though, that book, Monitoring, I really wrote it for my students. So you would have to read my other book, Boundless, to understand the monitoring book. And so don't buy the monitoring book first because it won't make sense. But we do use people called monitors who help uh, the viewer. Their job is to assist the viewer. Now, not to lead the viewer, not to help the viewer to the target, but simply to be there to assist the viewer. The viewer needs a drink of water. Uh, maybe the viewer is getting tired and should take a break. Whatever, whatever you know, would be helpful. But also we have a defined protocol and structure to the military method of controlled remote viewing. Therefore, a monitor's job is also to help the viewer stay in structure because it's very easy when you get lost into the target to kind of forget your structure and start sliding away from it. But the structure really helps the viewer get great information and maintains um, kind of a an emotional equilibrium throughout the session because emotions could totally shut down a session. So we want to keep an emotional equilibrium as well. And so sometimes having that structure there to support us while reviewing is just, you know, very valuable. Interesting that emotions shut that down. So this is your job, right? You run a company that offers these services as well as teaching the public. T tell us what kind of calls, phone calls you get in. I mean, um, you know, sorry, the, the naughty side of my mind was imagining you getting calls from jealous wives and husbands saying, go and check oh, up yeah. on them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, in fact, I got, I got more common email. ones, perhaps the, we can start yeah. with the missing person. I, I, did, I don't get a lot of those, but I did get an email once that said, uh, I, I have a target for you and I'll pay you, I, you know, a, a good sum of, sum of money to do this target for me. It didn't say anything about what the target was. And I responded with, you want me to remote view your husband to see if he's cheating on you. And I'm sorry, I don't take that, those types of jobs. Like, and she wrote back and said, you're absolutely right. Thank you very much. <laughs> but, uh, but and I, I did get a scary call once um, that from a, a guy with a very sinister sounding voice who wanted me, he said, uh, I'll pay you whatever you want. You've come highly recommended and I want you to find a missing thumb drive. And it just sounds, I mean, my every, you know, our body's the link, right? My body just really reacted to like, no, no, no. Every warning light went on and I, uh, I turned that one down and then he called like four times a day for the next few weeks. And I just didn't answer the call. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was scary. I mean, that was kind of freaky for me, but generally speaking, um, we get pretty reasonable things. I have to say, though, that there are really good companies out there whose primary task is to do remote viewing services, you know, helping to find lost items or helping to solve mysteries of whatever type. Our company is primarily education. We're, we're more education than service-based. However, in order to provide our more advanced students with opportunities to do operational viewing, of course, we do accept different projects. Um, the only reason we don't accept more projects is because project management becomes extremely time consuming. Having a group of viewers, we, we did a major project with 14 viewers working with an archaeologist to find um, a target that he had been looking for for 40 years in a 200 square mile area of ocean. He'd been looking for these artifacts in the ocean and, and he knew that this area had been at one time on dry land. The ocean, it's been covered with ocean for 18,000 years at least. But he really believed that at one point there had been a pre-Adamic civilization in this area and he wanted to find evidence of it. And he had been searching for 40 years without any success. So um, he said, well, I want to hire you guys. I've worked with remote viewers before. And I thought to myself, he's not worked with remote viewers before. He's probably worked with psychics, but we're not the same thing. And so... Um, so I said, okay, I didn't argue the point. I just said, okay. And then when we presented him with this gorgeous report, you know, with a with an executive summary and a table of contents and and all these sketches and report, you know, just everything reported out with with GPS coordinates. He called me and his voice was trembling. He said, I've, I've never worked with remote viewers before. <laughs> and it just, you know, it was a whole different thing. But the great news was that he was able to take out boats, divers, equipment, and go to those GPS coordinates and find what he'd been searching for for 40 years. Um, you also mentioned something there, which is quite unique, isn't it? Where you're looking to try and help companies make decisions in the future. Now, help the listeners and myself understand here, presumably remote viewing the future is a bit 
difficult because certain things have yet to be established that will lead to the, how the future becomes determined. Tell us what happens when you try and remote view too far into the future. Well, I have remote viewed very accurately into the future on a number of occasions, even as far as two years into the future. And we know that certain things in the future seem to be set. We don't know exactly why, but we do know that certain things seem to be set. And if it, and, and really, truly, uh, you know, there's I love st- I'm not a scientist, but I love studying quantum theory. It's just like a hobby. <laughs> I'm married to a scientist, but I love, I, I love, love, love studying quantum theory and re- listen, you know, reading books on quantum theory. And so the theory of time is something that no one truly understands. We have theories. We don't really know. But it seems from the evidence we can at least determine that time is happening all at once and that maybe we are moving through time, perhaps, uh, like moving through a field of bubbles or something. But the um, the I, we have been able to prove retrocausality. And I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with that term. And there's lots of books out now about time loops and retrocausality. And uh, I love talking about these things. And we have proven, even with my students, that retrocausality is a real thing. So if, for example, uh, let's say that, I'll, I'll give you an example that proves retrocausality, or at least provides some interesting evidence. Um, I have a viewer, an advanced viewer, who called me and said, Lori, I was working on a target. I was blind to the target. I worked on it. And in my mind, I could not get the gargoyles on St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome out of my head. Um, he said, then I pulled out the feedback and it didn't have anything to do with that. So I figured, okay, I missed the target, you know, and we, you know, no big deal. Then two days later, I did another target. I was blind to the target. I pull out the feedback and it's the gargoyles on St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome. <clears throat> so I think that on Monday, I viewed Wednesday's target. Uh, okay, so how do I handle that? I did a great job of viewing Wednesday's target, but, but it was, I was supposed to be viewing Monday's target. So I did a great job of viewing the wrong target. We call that displacement, and it happens to every remote viewer. And the the, the hardest thing about it is you did a damn good job of viewing the wrong target. <laughs> and so, but the interesting thing is we find that we actually cause that when we get excited about it, because it creates what we call a temporal attractor, an attractor through time. So in in this case, I had a, I had a case of a young lady who uh, was doing a target, and she became convinced that the target was probably the plane crashing into the Pentagon on September 11th in the United States. So she became convinced that was her target. And then she, when she opened the feedback, it had nothing to do with that whatsoever. So she goes and she sits down to turn and turns on the television and there's a general talking about the plane crashing into the Pentagon on September 11th. So she gets really excited and going, oh, this must be what I viewed. This is what I viewed. And then she gets very excited. She runs and gets her session and her summary, starts comparing what she got with what he was saying. Then she goes on Google to even Google more information. So what she was doing was all that excitement and all that research was causing, was feeding back through time causing her to actually view the wrong target. She actually messed up her own session through retrocausality. And we see it all the time with students and we see evidence of it regularly. So listeners, we (laughs) will be covering this phenomena. Uh, I think it was uh, John Wheeler who did a version of the uh, double slit experiment in which he caused, uh, well, he he proved a certain kind of, of retrocausality in that very, very particular quantum mechanical experiment. So we're definitely going to be looking at that. And how interesting to hear it happening, uh, this, uh, this strange time attractor also in remote viewing. Now, moving on, Laurie, um, in episode 12, uh, about the experimenter effect and the role of intention and expectation in scientists in science, uh, physicist Garrett Medell explained that with his students at Colorado University in his fringes of science course, he gets a significant result with about half of his students. Russell Targ also mentioned this that when he tried it one day when one of his viewers didn't turn up to work and he got really good results. Is it true that more or less anyone can do this? Very much so. I have not found a viewer yet who can't do it. And the funny thing is when I tell viewers that, because I get asked that all the time by people who are thinking about taking a course, and they go, well, is it really true that anyone can do this? And I say, yes, anyone can do it. And I know the first thing they think is, 
I'll be the first one. I can't do it. <laughs> oh no, I'll be the first, I'll be her first student that can't do it. And so I always say, are you thinking I'll be the first one? And they, they always say, yes, that's just what I was thinking. <laughs> but um, yeah, so yes, anyone can do it. I have had uh, guys from MIT take my course. And these guys are like, I'm telling you, I am like completely 100% left brained, I won't be able to do this. And then they do great. I had a a lady come in who was super excited. She was an author. She was so excited to take the course. And her husband, who is an engineer came to take the course only to see what's my wife getting into? You know, is this is this some kind of crazy cult? And so that was his only reason. And then he did so great in the course. He did better than she did. And it made her really mad. She's like, he doesn't even care about this. And he's doing better than me. But certain people are more talented, I assume. I mean, looking at the comparisons between viewers' drawings and the targets they were viewing, I mean, it really does look like some people in the original Stargate unit, for example, Ingo Swan, I mean, Pat Price, Joseph McGonagall, were particularly talented. Has there been any research into the types of brains that seem to have a predisposition for this talent, or does it just appear to be random? If if there has been research into the types of brain that have this talent, I am not aware of the research, but that doesn't mean it hasn't happened. However, I have just in, you know, now I think of all the teachers on the planet, I, I teach more students than any other person out there than any of my competitors, if you want to call them that. I, I, I like to think of us more as collaborators than competitors, but um I I just teach, you know, I just I have a very thriving business now and and uh a lot of people are really interested in exploring consciousness. And I do feel that the exploration of consciousness is the final frontier, you know, and it's also like a survival skill that we should all develop. Because to me, it's just another sense, like our sense of eyesight, our sense of hearing, our sense of smelling, our sense of intuition. It should be just another sense that we're quite used to. And I think that would take away a lot of the woo-woo that we, you know, is associated with it. I think it would also uh, remove the stigma and, you know, and we could just make it a normal thing. I think it should be a normal thing uh, that we develop all the time. And so remind me what your question was again, because I sailed well, off into I, I, I was <laughs> interested in this idea of whether certain people were more talented than others uh, a priori, or if actually this was a skill that they developed over years of training. I mean, is it a training thing or is it? talent that's my question i guess well i think it can be a combination of both but i'll tell you what i've observed from all these students that i've taught for many years now in the thousands and um what i've observed is that some people come in with a natural intuitive ability that they maybe been you know really intuitive all their lives and have had a lot of unexplained things like knowing who's going to call you know when the phone rings i just know who it's going to be or or that kind of a thing, or precognitive dreams, you know, I have a dream and it comes true. Um, Many, you know, that sort of thing. A lot of people have had that throughout their lives and they come and take this course. And if they have good left brain skills, like let's say you have someone who utilizes like a police detective who has to use intuition daily, really, you know, to keep themselves safe. They found that police, like Pat Price, tend to have high levels of intuition and accurate intuition because they have to use it daily. At the same time, they have good left brain skills as well because they have a lot of, they have reports they have to fill out. They have all these things. So I'll often find people who use intuition daily, but they also have a job that requires them to do their own taxes and and do things that require left brain skills. And if you have a person with really a great balance of left and right brain skills, they are like the prime person for CRV. Now, I've had people who are like scary in their intuitive talents, so good that they're scary, but they just can't do CRV mm. because they're so right brained that having any kind of structure is impossible for them. They just, you know, it's sort of like, wait, what's my name again? You know, it's a, you know I'm just a little too spacey for CRV. <laughs> Jim yeah. Lynn used to joke with me. My mentor used to joke, he'd be like, oh, I just came back from teaching in San Francisco and there was this lady wearing this crazy getup and 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 every day, you know, on the third day of class, she's like, wait a minute, where do I put my name on the paper again? And he said, I felt like I was going to have to tie a tether to her ankle and hold, you know, pull her down every few minutes because she would start to float away. Mm. So the, those are, what you know, extremely right brain people. And to be honest with you, I was so right brained when I started taking the course, I had a really hard time remembering the 
structure. And I don't know how Lynn had the faith that I would ever learn to become a teacher with this, but I but I also come from a long line, generations of teachers, mm. teachers, and doctors in my family. And I love the science behind medicine and I love teaching. It just gives me such joy. So my goals in everything I produce for my school, for my students, any book I write is always present this in a way that anybody could get it. Present it in a way that makes it interesting so people want to read it and it's not boring and dry. And so that's always been my goal. Bring it down to the to the lowest rung of the ladder so that anybody can get this. And it's fun and it's easy to digest. But I do, to answer specifically the questions about talent, I have found that there are people who are less talented psychically or intuitively who tend to just doggedly, determinedly practice, 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 and they become world-class good. Mm. So I have found that, like we we say, I, give me the choice between a natural psychic and a really well-practiced remote viewer, and I'll take the remote viewer any day. Mm. Because the discipline of the structure and the discipline that it requires to practice causes just a growth in that in, in your brain that part of your brain that is connected to whatever the wherever this information is coming from we we like to call it the great big cosmic database in the sky but <laughs> you know well, just this is a- this is exactly where we want to go next Lori. i mean before we talk about the way this phenomena has been received by the general public and the military officials and the scientific community let's talk about this kind of information that is being received the, you know, from the cosmic database, or you know, because we <laughs> really don't know yet, do we? So, so in episode twenty-seven with uh, out-of-body experience specialist and physicist Tom Campbell, he speaks about what he, with all his years of experience, can only call a different type of information that our consciousness seems to be able to access—a kind of what he calls intuitive information. Now, the existence of this type of information is controversial in mainstream science, not least because it's unverifiable using the method, but it's also subjective and therefore can be misinterpreted. And that leads to a margin of error. So this margin caused the famous skeptic psychologist Ray Hyman to refute the effectiveness of of remote viewing, despite acknowledging that the effect sizes were, quote, too large to be dismissed as statistical flukes. So, so what is your theory on the nature of this information that's being received by your viewers, Laurie? And, and, and do you think traditional scientists, science can accommodate it and study it, even if it is subjective? Well, I was very impressed in having a conversation with Russell Targ. Russ is such a great guy, um, and, and I just enjoy him a lot. And we were having a conversation one day, and Russ said that in, in the years that SRI was researching things like telepathy and clairvoyance and that sort of thing, that they came up with more concrete proof that it exists, that telepathy, clairvoyance, and all these things exist, than that the FDA has proving that aspirin is effective as a pain reliever. So The great no statistics, isn't that is a great yeah. statistic? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's a great statement, you know, and, and uh, so the, the thing about it, as far as my own belief system or what I feel it's coming from it's it's very interesting because i came from quite a binary belief system it was pretty my my belief system prior to coming into this was pretty black and white i had i had gotten involved with a christian group and become a missionary and so i had pretty much gotten very into a dogmatic belief system i've never been a dogmatic person but the belief system itself is pretty you know binary there's god and the devil you know there's heaven and hell there's black and white you know it just was very binary and um i remember that when the hubble telescope photos first started coming out i reacted kind of strangely even for me my my objective observer that it, that looks at myself and sees how i react to things was kind of going well that's kind of odd because i i reacted kind of freaked out by the hubble hubble telescopes photos because suddenly if if these beautiful clouds we're looking at are gazillions of suns much bigger than our sun and a lot of those suns might be surrounded by planets that could contain life i had never really thought much about things like extraterrestrial life, you know, those types of things. It just wasn't part of my thought processes. You know, I didn't think about things like that. So all of a sudden, the thought that there could be more to reality than I had ever thought about kind of blew open my whole belief system. 
to the point where uh, I, I now understand that there, there very possibly might be multiple dimensions beyond the dimensions that we're aware of and multiple universes and things. And, and would you, if you had asked me 40 years ago about these things, I would have just probably run away. <laughs> you know, I would have run the opposite direction. Uh, and, and I did not find out what I believe now through science, which is now bearing out quantum theory is bearing out many things that I have learned through remote viewing that have come to me through remote viewing sessions that truly blew my mind. And one thing that's quite fascinating is how information can come to a remote viewer that the remote viewer has no knowledge of. So to give you an example, my husband is a retired forensic scientist. Um, and, you know, and I've been, I, of course, was married to him before he retired as well. But when he he is a world class remote viewing monitor. So he will monitor me in a session. And at one point we were hired by a company to determine the cause of an airplane crash. And so I, at one point in my session, and I didn't know what I was remote viewing, but at one point in my session, I said, something is failing. So I'd already described the cockpit and the pilots. And then I said, something's failing. And so my husband gave me a move command, move to the failing and describe. So instantly, I'm going like this with my hands, being a good Italian, you know, going, well, it's like, you know, and he says, could you sketch that for me? And I was like, oh, well, I know nothing about machines. I can't sketch this. He said, just try, try sketching for me. Well, I ended up sketching the internal part of an airplane engine. I know nothing about mechanics. I know nothing about airplane engines. But I ended up sketching this entire section of this airplane engine accurately and the only reason at the time my husband knew, and of course the monitor's job is to stay completely expressionless. You don't give anything away with your facial expression. So he didn't say a word. He's just watching. But his father was an airplane mechanic and he knew exactly what I was drawing, but I didn't know what I was drawing. And I drew this schematic of, of the uh, bearings inside this airplane engine. And then we later got photographs of the airplane engine and it was really accurate. So I was like, wow, I was, you know, how does that even work that I could describe the internal parts of an airplane engine when I know nothing about that? Or, and then in other sessions, I've talked, I've given scientific information regarding waves and frequencies and things like that. When at that time in my life, I had never read a thing about that, didn't know anything about it. The, the, the terms waves and frequencies were never part of my lexicon or my common, you know, manner of speaking. And so those kinds of sessions, my husband will later tell me that he's just internally on the edge of his seat because he knows I know nothing about what I'm talking about, but he completely understands what I'm saying because he's a scientist. And so it's been fascinating to actually obtain information through this mechanism of our magnificent brains that actually gives information about things that that we have no knowledge of, and then could later be born out. Like Ingo Swan describing the rings around Jupiter many years before the rings around Jupiter were ever discovered through technology. But is it intuitive information? Do you think that's a good sort of starting point to try and push from our present scientific paradigm to say, listen, there's another type of information that's working its way into consciousness? in a different kind of way. Do you think that's a good place to start or do you think that that's a misleading word? You know, the word intuition is so diverse in the in what it can mean. Uh, just as the word psychic, you know, it's like I'm, for most of my life, the word psychic has been a four-letter word that should never be spoken. <laughs> you know, Because it has so many unfortunate connotations, right? So intuition is a little bit less alarming or less controversial because even you know everyone knows that we all have intuition and everyone has that gut instinct i should go here i shouldn't go there i should do this i shouldn't do that i think there's not a person on the planet who hasn't experienced their gut into intuition kind of guiding them in some way or another at some point in their lives but um but i do think personally this is just my own feelings on the matter i feel that reality is not at all what we think it is and that it's possible that we might even be living in a virtual reality you know and that what we're what we are commonly experiencing isn't necessarily what we think it is mm. and if that's true 
if that is true and that we are experiencing kind of uh, um, uh, maybe even a reality that either we ourselves are creating as it, as we go, or we're in some sort of a reality that is um, circular in that, you know, everything is happening all at once and we're stepping into various time forms. I even once had a thought, and this is just a crazy theoretical thing. It's not, I believe this firmly, but I even had a curious thought that what if the conscious mind and the subconscious mind are actually not as connected as we think they are? And what if uh, what if we have a conscious mind living in these bodies, but the subconscious minds are here for growth, and therefore the subconscious minds kind of move from body to body throughout a period of time, you know, so like I, uh, you know, suddenly there is a subconscious mind that steps into you or a consciousness that steps into you and experiences your life immediately taking on your memories and taking on your conscious experiences and lives your life for a period of time to learn the lessons that that period of time in your life is going to provide. And then once those lessons have been learned, that that consciousness steps out and another consciousness steps in. That's a that very interesting, very interesting idea. And and have you got any other? I mean, you know, I asked you what's your theory about it. I mean, obviously, theory is a very elaborate sort of word for it. But I mean, there you just got one. There must have been many of these flashes throughout your career where you thought you had a flash of of how the 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 world really is made. Would there are there any other ideas similar to that one you've just described that you think get close to it? Yes, I have. Um, I've had some experiences in my room of viewing uh, that were actually quite eye-opening for me. Um, that are hard to explain. But um, I one time was asked to describe a future technology that would allow um, humans to communicate with other dimensions. And I was blind to the target. I had no idea what I was remote viewing. But I, I started describing this thing, and I described it in great detail. And, and that is one difference between controlled remote viewing by truly world-class and, and uh, experienced professionals versus um, other types of intuitive teachings or functionings in that you can get a tremendous amount of detail uh, working on, a, for example, a research project involving microphages eating antibiotic-resistant bacteria. Um, I came up with close to 200 perceptions. They were then graded by four specialists in microphages. They were scientists who knew nothing about remote viewing, but they graded it for accuracy. And they found that it was 98% accurate with over 200 perceptions. So, you know, so we, we can get great amounts of detail. And in this session that I did, I got a great amount of detail and sketches and things and supplied these, including schematics on how to build this thing, et cetera. And then when I was finished, suddenly I was getting more, you know, more stuff to write down. It was sort of like, wait, not done yet. Kept writing things down. And the information that I wrote down from that point on was more about how any kind of a physical device like this would be totally unnecessary because humans are already endowed with a machine inside the cranium that can do this. And really one of the most surprising experiences that I had that totally blew my mind to be frank was when i was asked by coast to coast am radio if i would remote view three targets totally blind to these three targets and what they were and then if i would come on the radio with two million listeners and just share what i got about target one target two and target three and then they would then tell me what the targets were oh well, that's <laughs> great that's great radio listening. god you gotta love coast to coast haven't you and so I did it. And the funny thing is my mentor was like, well, are you sure you want to do that? And I said, well, it's either going to make me or break me. You know, it'll either make my reputation or completely put me into retirement, you know, one or the other. But the first target I was, uh, was interestingly Bigfoot or Sasquatch. Now, I had never thought about Bigfoot or Sasquatch. just wasn't part of my thought processes. I remember seeing Harry and the Hendersons when I was a kid, and that was about it, you know, as far as my experience with ever considering Sasquatch or Bigfoot. So I'm starting the session, and I'm suddenly communicating with a being that was highly intelligent and that I immediately understood was a an interdimensional being whose 
defense mechanism. Now this part, then I started thinking, oh my gosh, I can never share this on the radio, you know, because people are going to think I'm nuts. And then I found out afterwards that this, what I was sharing was like, oh yeah, everybody already knows that. You know, <laughs> Here I was thinking I was getting this amazing information, but the the information that I got was that just as a skunk uses this foul smelling spray or a rattlesnake has venom in its, you know, in its fangs. And those are the defense mechanisms of those animals. Um, that the being that we refer to as Sasquatch or Bigfoot is an interdimensional being whose defense mechanism is time travel. And so if you were going to try to capture Bigfoot or shoot Bigfoot or anything like that, suddenly, uh, suddenly this, this, this being just vanishes because he has the ability to travel through time. If that makes sense. So I thought this was mind blowing and just totally too crazy to even report, et cetera. And, and then I spoke to several friends of ours who are Native Americans and they say, oh, all Native Americans know that Sasquatch is a time traveler. It's like, that's like common knowledge. And I was just like, oh, first time I ever heard that. But, um, but the thing that blew my mind and, and, and refers to your question about, you know, how, how this has altered my belief systems is that I, I had never connected in such a deep way with a being that I felt was an interdimensional being. And I felt that I gained so much from this being, you know, from this interaction and this session that I did. And I actually have the summary of that session um, on the media page of my website um, where, you know, it's got a, it's got that you can pull it right up and read the whole, the whole summary. But the the thing about it that was so amazing was the love that was there. It was like a strong sense of love. And through multiple different remote viewings on a whole bunch of different subjects, all of which I was blind to, the one theme that is very consistent is that love is not just an emotion. Love is not what, the way we perceive love. That love is literally a force, you know, much in the way we think of gravity. It's It's a true force. That it, and it is the only constant through all dimensions and all realities and, you know, just all universes. It is the one constant. No matter how many weird things you encounter, this is the one thing that is constant. And so uh, it's, it's extremely strong. It's an extremely strong force. And, um, and that, that suddenly, you know, my old Bible days came up with the, um, you know, the concept of God is love. Well, if love is a powerful force, that would really make sense. You know, you know, in a more etheric way, but or esoteric concept. But it makes it makes so much sense to me, and suddenly that had much more meaning than it had had ever had to me before as a missionary. Um, so, and in some I, way, you're you're suggesting here as well that this uh, this access to a, a, a sort of block. You know, we're back to the the time. Uh, question here uh, in listeners um, our episode with Paul Davies on the implications of Einstein talks not only about time but also about intuition and how Einstein was very very clear that that he, he was getting these equations through his intuition which is interesting hearing that come not only from Einstein but also Paul Davies who's a cosmologist saying you know he he's had experiences where he's getting stuff that couldn't have come any other way and he doesn't know where it's coming from but he knows it's true uh you know mm -hmm. it's great to know that there are scientists of that caliber willing to say I don't know where it's coming from but I know it's true um it, it does sound like you're suggesting that we have this sort of uh, singular dimensional perception, which is in stark contrast to this other type of perception, this other type of access to information that that really can spread out across time and space quite universally. A, a good example of this, which I've quoted before in our Altered States of Consciousness episode with David Luke, is when uh, in ayahuasca experiences quite often we perceive things from other people's points of view. So we will relive experiences, but from the point of view of somebody we were in the room with, quite often where you're experiencing something that they are feeling quite bad about thanks to your behavior, and then suddenly you're seeing it from <laughs> the other point of view, it's a massive wake-up call. That kind of, it sounds to me like you're suggesting that there's almost a an ethical teaching process coming via this altered uh, this alternate type of information. Do you think that there may even be an ethical dimension to to sort of the existence, the purpose of this kind of information? 
I do. I do believe that there's something really profound that uh, that we are all here for. And uh, I realize that that's a controversial stand to think that we all of our existence is, is it does have a purpose and we are here to learn and to say, what are we here to learn? I don't know. Is Are we here to learn about love? Are we here to to learn how we're all connected? What are we here to learn about? I don't know exactly. But I do know uh, that I have experienced personally so many unexplainable manifestations and miracles and, and things in my life uh, that I know without a shadow of a doubt that reality is not what we think it is. Um, and that we, that it is, I believe that reality is malleable. Um, I, and this is, this is a little story, just a quick story of something that happened when you were talking about where you experienced someone else's reactions, you did something to hurt them. And then you, you suddenly have a dream or you experience what they felt and how you made them feel and as if it was you feeling those things. It's a huge wake up call. So, um, I had just gone through a divorce and was quickly uh, quickly followed by my current husband who who just felt he we had we had had a we'd been brought together by unusual circumstances and had both been having dreams about each other prior to meeting so but i was very resistant i was like no 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 i don't need to be getting into another relationship i just got divorced you know blah 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 you know the things that all us humans think about and meanwhile, he just had this, he's a very laid back, quiet, shy person. You would never expect this of him, but he felt this compulsion that we were supposed to be together. Uh, I, on the other hand, was like, no, I'm going to tell this guy I'm never going to see him again. <laughs> that night that I made this decision that I would never see him again, these beings came to me in the night in a dream. So dream, you know, just take it as a dream. These beings came and they said, we want to show you why this relationship is going to be very important to your development. And then subsequently showed me the interactions of my current husband and his mother, specific incidents where they were having an argument or whatever. And I was able to, I was like omniscient. I knew how everyone was feeling, not just my husband, but how everyone was feeling. And then interactions with his ex-wife and him and how everyone was feeling in the situation. And it gave me great understanding about his feelings about women and what, how they came to be. And so this thing lasted all night long. And then it, I was awakened by my current husband calling me. And uh, I picked up the phone and was just, you know, half asleep and was like, wow. And I started telling him what I had observed all night long. And he just kept saying, you can't possibly know that. You can't possibly know that. That the the, the actual incidents that I had seen when I related them to him, they were actual incidents that had occurred in his life. And so, you know, you think about things like that and you're just like, how, you know, where does this information come from? I wanted to come back to the skeptics and the resistance. You yourself just described beautifully that resistance where you're sort of more earthly more terrestrial three-dimensional self it's like oh no no i can't you know and, and you we have all these earthly worries that because we're not in access to the information that will bring us to that future so i just want to go back to the way uh remote viewing has been so skeptically received and 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 i just want to briefly mention for the listeners this famous 1995 report that commissioned by the CIA that led to the cancelling of the Stargate program, and it included a statistical analysis of the results that supported the efficiency of the phenomena from the respected professor uh, uh, of statistics at the University of California, Jessica Utz, who, who I, I hope one day to get on the show to explain that. But the report was also co-authored by a famous refuter of these psi phenomena, Ray Hyman, who I, who I mentioned before, and it concluded this. Even though a statistically significant effect has been observed in the laboratory, it remains unclear whether the existence of a paranormal phenomena remote viewing has been demonstrated. Already to me, that sounds like a contradiction. But this <laughs> final line, the laboratory studies do not provide evidence regarding the origins or the nature of the phenomena, assuming it exists. That's just something I want to get your opinion on here, Laurie, because we come across this all the time in, in fringe sciences. Regarding these reports that the lab experiments didn't provide evidence regarding the origin or nature, a point which, to my mind, is completely separate from this idea of prov proving its existence, does it seem scientific to you, Laurie, to acknowledge 
the significant results supporting its existence, only then to dismiss the evidence because we can't explain its origin or nature. Does that sound scientific? My experience, um, now there's, there's a skeptic. The skeptic is like, okay, I'm having trouble believing this, but I'm open to hearing more, right? That's what a skeptic is. Then there are the complete refuters who are like, my mind's made up, don't confuse me with the facts, right? <laughs> so, um, and so what I found, and, and my understanding with Jessica Oates was that she was blown away when she dove into those files, that she, Russell Targ's data, the one you told him, like the more uh, proof than the, oh God, the efficacy yeah. of, of aspirin. She, in fact, she was so impressed with the data that she herself took classes and became a remote viewer. That's how impressed she was, and she still attends all the you know the conferences that we have, the International Remote Viewing Association conferences, and and the uh, Applied Pre- Precognition conferences. She is she is off frequently attending those, and she goes all over the world speaking about remote viewing. Mm. and consciousness and she's so, ridiculed on wikipedia yes yes exactly yeah so and so she was the you know it was two people assigned to go look at this but what they wanted those two people to find was a good reason to shut the program down and so it didn't help that suddenly one of the two people writes a report that's glowing that's not helping our cause we want to shut this darn thing down and so they had ray just sort of whitewash everything jessica came up with is my understanding and, and formulate a report that pretty much hid everything she found. She said her report was completely shoved under the table. The reason I ask about this uh, apparent need to understand the nature of a phenomena before we can truly integrate it into our worldview is that there was and there continues to be significant resistance to the reality of the phenomena in the military, in the skeptical scientific community. And in the US military, for example, there was a strong religious conservative influence that considered the use of, the, of such a phenomena as demonic, as, exactly. it, as exactly. it appeared to break the laws of physics. But shouldn't science work the other way around? That that we change wow. our concept of the laws of physics based on what's experimentally de- demonstrable? I mean, not to define yes. what's Ready. possible Ready. based on our preconceptions. Tolstoy said, the only thing we learn from history is that we never learn from history, right? <laughs> so if you look, if you look at history... If you look at history, how has history played out? Well, back when the early scientists said, hey, there's these invisible things called germs that can kill you and doctors need to start washing their hands when they deliver babies or do surgery. And they were those scientists were hooted out of, you know, they were literally made fun of and their careers demolished because, oh, there's little invisible things, little invisible bugs. Oh, yeah, right. Invisible bugs. You know, they, they were hooted and hollered at. Um, his, so his, history proves that science, falsely so-called, is is often a, a very rigid mindset that once it accepts something as truth, nothing can belie that. Nothing, anything that uh, threatens that truth becomes anathema. Mm. You know, instantly becomes anathema. Tell us about and, some of the responses from the public, from the conservative religious folks in your community, from some of the, the maybe some of the more skeptical minded people you've come across. Why do you think they take such a strong denier position despite these 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 clearly significant results? Oh, I have a one word answer for you. Fear. At the basis of every real vehement denier is fear. Fear of the unknown? I think it's fear that threatens their their understanding of reality. And I can relate to that because coming from a very fundamentalist Christian experience for 20 years of my life, I wasn't raised as a Christian. My parents were agnostic. But when when I was 14... And I met these Jesus people and became a missionary for 20 years of my life, from 14 to 34. Um, And it was, you know, there was a lot of dogma there, and it it really captures you up in it. And there, and it, and you, identity plays a huge role in our lives. You identify yourself as an actor, as a radio personality, etc. Right? Um, And that's your identity. If suddenly your identity is ripped away from you, which I frequently saw as the head of a refugee resettlement program where, you know, a a doctor who was an eminent doctor and a professor of anatomy in Afghanistan suddenly finds himself with, you know, in a strange country, not able to speak the language, not able to get a job, having to work as a janitor in a hospital. 
you know, I mean, that rips your sense of identity away from you. And we cling to our identities. That's, that's our egos need that to know who we are. Who am I in this universe? Right. So if somebody's suddenly going to come up and threaten my understanding of reality, that threatens my identity and who I am and how I see myself fitting into this reality that I'm in. And that becomes a threat. And I want to fight that because it threatens my security. It, it, it frightens me. Oh, come on, give us a good, give us a good juicy story of somebody who actually, (laughs) who actually opened up to it despite their fear. I'm sure you've got many. What's the best story you've got of somebody who was absolutely stuck in the mud, was refusing uh, to understand this. And then, and then, and then they just had the experience that changed all of that. Well, I don't know if I have the best stories on this, but I have a couple of quick ones. One is my, I have a son who, uh, who became a, a very fervent atheist and uh, decided, you know, he didn't believe in God. He didn't believe in anything. If you can't, you can't touch it and you can't, you know, taste it or see it. It doesn't exist. And um, we were visiting and I, I totally believe in accepting my children unconditionally. You know, whatever they believe is great. It's fine. Um, and, and he would say things like, well, mom, uh, you know, I know that you're honest and I know you would never deceive anybody. But when I see mediums and stuff like that, I think, oh, they're just body reading body language or whatever. I, I can't believe they're really doing that. So um, so he basically told me he didn't believe in anything that I believe in, <laughs> you know, doesn't believe in remote viewing or anything. So we sit down with his wife and kids and we're going to play Yahtzee. And in Yahtzee, in the game Yahtzee, you have, you have I think, six dice and you're trying to roll where every single dice rolls a six. So you have six sixes. And so um, so every time it was my turn, I rolled six sixes. And so, you know, he they would everybody would play and it would be my turn. And I would go and I would just imagine the, the dice all turning into sixes and I would roll them and they would be six sixes. And about the fifth or sixth time I did it, he said, Mom, come on, it's not fair for you to use that stuff. And I said, What stuff? <laughs> what stuff? <laughs> I said, what stuff? You just told me you didn't believe in any of this stuff. Um, I had another son who was pretty skeptical and would always express skepticism. And then one day he would call and say, okay, you know, I just had a dream about dad. What's going on with dad? Or, you know, he would, he would come up and, and say things. And, uh, and one of my other sons said, to, I have nine children. And one of my other sons said to him, how you can't possibly deny this with everything you've seen. And he said, you're right. I really can't deny it. So, um, so my, that's addressing my own children. Right. Um, I've also had, people run into church people. And I wrote an article that's in my blog that's called How to Talk to Devout Christians About CRB, because there are people who automatically feel that it's evil. And when I first joined the refugee program was when they first started allowing the very first Kurdish people into the United States. Mm -hmm. And I was find a CIA operative to keep an eye on me and on the program. And he stuck to me like glue, this guy. And he was a fervent Christian. And so I had to be very careful not to reveal to him that I was involved in CRV. And he was a member of the CIA. But like you said, there was a very strong religious faction in the CIA at the time that wanted to do away with the program because they felt that it could lead to demon possession or, you know, whatever. And so I'm seeing in our, a sad thing across the world. And it's it's almost like um, like a spiritual epidemic in the sense that you're seeing belief systems that are quite backwards and fundamental and superstitious coming into play that are ruling so many things, you know, like the, the, the use of a person's body, uh, you know, the, you know, just so many things, marrying the people you love, uh, you know, so trying to govern the minute aspects of people's lives based on fear and superstition. Mm. Um, And so I have had, I did have an interesting thing happen. I was hired when I was hired to find out the cause of that airplane crash. Um, my session was so accurate that the person who received it and read it thought this person has to be cheating. They have to be lying there. There must have, they must have read about the airplane crash. They must know things because I, I put so many things in there that were accurate. And so they came back and they were like, wow, this, this really blew our minds, but it, it makes us question whether you're really honest. I mean, did you, did you study this beforehand? Were you given information? And I wasn't. And I said, well, now you've put me into a catch 22, because if I do really well, you think I'm cheating. And if I do really badly, you say, well, CRV doesn't work. So how can I win? You know, <laughs> but it happens, but it happens often. And in, in Russell Targ's film, Third Eye Spies, listeners, you must go and see it for more background on where where this all started. Um, he mentions how many, many uh, 
both politicians and military remote viewer, uh, military brass who were shocked that money was going from the military coffers into this program sort of stormed into their unit saying how dare you you know take government money to do this and and they just said just just sit down and 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 do it and that's what the russell's uh default thing to do was just get sit them down do it and then they would do it and then they'd be like holy shamoli you know and i think this oh, yes. actually is quite thing <laughs> it's quite a good thing is it's you just people just have to experience stuff before they're going to open up and um i just want to use that as a little springboard because you mentioned there uh this this difficult question about demon possession and um, demonic questions. You know, we've spoken a little bit about interdimensional uh, questions, and on chasing consciousness, we are we are not scared to to cover altered states of consciousness, extra dimensional entities, and realms. It's certainly something that we're we're going to be covering in more and more detail. What um, what are the most extraordinary impressions that you've received in your own sessions? You've already told us some really quite fascinating stories. There's another element that you mentioned yeah. as well about the fact that that you felt love from the Sasquatch. So in some way, the Sasquatch must have known you were viewing them. Yes, and afterwards, after the the fallout, if you want to call it that, of doing the Sasquatch uh, session was that right after that, for months later, um, there was some crazy events that happened in the house. We started having physical objects sort of fly across the room. Uh, my husband and I were watching a movie on our laptop computer at the table because we were off grid sitting at the table. And so we didn't, you know, it was the night where we didn't have a lot of electricity. So rather than using the television to watch something, we were using the laptop and his glasses were on the table because he doesn't need them to view the, the laptop. And, uh, Suddenly his his glasses just started hopping across the table. And I and I saw them. They went behind the laptop. So I said, Hey Jim, Jim, your glasses are hopping across the table. And he leans over and watches them and goes, Well, I'll be damned, they are. <laughs> you know? And we just sort of watched them move. And then another night, we had a really interesting experience. We were um getting ready to watch a documentary. And as we began the documentary, a chair of just a dining chair that was sitting about six feet ahead of us between us and the television set suddenly just leaned over onto two legs very gently and then just leaned back onto its four legs again. And so Jim looks at me and said, did you see that? And I said, I did see that. Did you see that? He said, I did see that. And then we just kept watching the documentary because we didn't know what to make of it. You know, it was just physical objects began moving around quite a bit. Um, and, uh, and we had some just bizarre phenomena that and we live right on the edge of a national forest. Our, our west gate opens into the national forest. So, and and according to Sasquatch experts, I of which I am not one, uh, they they said, oh, well, you know, if you live on the edge of a national forest, you're going to have experiences with Sasquatch because Sasquatch always lives in forests. But um, we just started. We had doors just spontaneously locking and unlocking and locking and unlocking. We had just the really bizarre physical phenomena occurring for a few months after I did that session on Sasquatch. Well, now for <laughs> you and I, for you and I that study consciousness, that, that we could start opening up to all kinds of other explanations and understandings of physical reality. But for your fundamental Christian, that sounds demonic. Do you think, this is sort of playing devil's advocate now, do you think that in some sense that the fear is justified then there you are you're interacting with a remote viewing target and i think in the ufo community they call this um hitchhiking where once uh ufo experiences have been uh in certain places having certain experiences they then take something home i mean obviously maybe physical space doesn't work but quite the way we think so it, 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 but that's our analogy this hitchhiking and then suddenly they're getting stuff happening at home that would make me pretty scared. Do you think that some of this fear is justified? No, not really. And I'll tell you why. Um, I used to be a very fearful person and controlled remote viewing, the practice of controlled remote viewing has totally eliminated all the fears that I had regarding that which we do not understand. As humans, as any kind of creature, I mean, you look at bugs or you know fish or anything, they're afraid of what they don't understand. And if something approaches them, they're going to run away. You know, that's just human nature. That's our survival skills kicking in. 
And so I just was afraid of everything. And I think uh, fundamental Christianity in itself is based on a lot of fear, you know, in order to control people or whatever. And I mean, I, I love I love true Christianity, but I'm just talking about organizational things designed to control people. And so I found that, uh, you know, having been subject to that type of control and that type of fear, in, instilling that type of fear in people, I dislike anything that tries to instill fear fear in people. And at the same time, I recognize that fear is a part of being human, and we tend to fear that which we do not understand. My husband, when he wanted to move from a traditional home into an earth ship, um, I I was scared. I was like, I don't know if I can do that. You know, it's off grid, and it's like living like the Flintstones in a dirt house. You know, can I do it? And uh, so I went to for a month and spent a month at the Earthship Academy, where every other day I was helping to build an Earthship, Earthship in a different stage of build. And in between, we were sitting in the classroom learning about Earthships and how they work. And I became very excited and envisioned because now I wasn't afraid of it. I understood and I could do it. And we lived in our Earthships for six years. So we tend to fear that which we don't understand. So fear is at the bottom of every accusation and every fear. Now, I get a lot of letters from people who say, I think I'm being remote viewed by, you know, the government's remote viewing me. Um, I think, you know, somebody's spying on me. I get a lot of things like that. And there is a lot of paranoia out there right now. People are scared and they're paranoid. And so I always feel like the best defense is to refuse to be afraid. And so when 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 physical phenomena occurs around me that has no explanation, am I afraid? I'm never afraid anymore. It, I have to say that I've had a lot of physical phenomena since I was very, very young happening around me. It's been a pretty normal thing. I asked my husband, have you had this your whole life? He's like, not till I married you. But, <laughs> <laughs> but he experiences it now. You know, it happens, it happens in a room and he's there. He experiences it. Um, but so you, you know, do so, think so you do think there's a connection between this kind of remote viewing uh activity shall we say accessing that non-local intuitive information we were discussing before can in some sense open up a gate that changes our relationship with uh quotidian physical reality I think so because up until that point I never believed in Sasquatch but then suddenly I'm actually having interaction after the session uh, well, it, it with Sasquatch, and uh, and when I say interaction, I, I if you want me to, I can explain what I mean. And what I mean is that uh, when I was fifteen, I fell madly in love with another fifteen-year-old <laughs> boy, and uh, we were just madly in love with each other. And then, of course, as life takes on, you know, we had to break up. And for years, I thought about this guy and wondered what happened to him, you know. And and I heard that he had died, and I just always thought, you know, I would always think about him for years and years. I think about him, and then finally, I stopped thinking about him. And so one day, after doing the Sasquatch session, I um, I'm a, I'm one of 36 moderators on a remote viewing Facebook page, and I get a little thing that all the moderators get saying, "So and so would like to join your group." And, um, you know, there's 36 of us and I see this thing and it's this guy's name. And I'm thinking, oh, it can't be the same person. You know, now it's been what, 50 years. It's been 50 years since I've had any contact with this person. And I think to Jim, you know, hey, this thing just came up. Usually I just click approve and I don't even look at it. But this time I go to the profile and it is this guy that I was the madly in love with when I was 15. And uh, and so it turns out that the reason this person was asking to become part of the remote viewing group was because this person was a part of a Sasquatch remote viewing group in Facebook. And the of that group had come out saying, oh, my gosh, you guys, a professional remote viewer just did a session on Sasquatch for Coast to Coast AM. Who did the session? It was me. Who's suddenly seeing this in my phone? Me. So I'm, I, I message this person and I say, hey, you wouldn't happen to be the same so-and-so that lived in such and such a place during such and such a year because I'm, and then I put my maiden name in there and this person writes back and it's like, Oh my gosh, Lori, I can't believe it's you, you know, and we have, and so, and he explains that the whole reason he wanted to get involved with remote viewing was because he has 13 acres in Tennessee and there's a whole family of Sasquatch living on his land and they come into his house and do all kinds of things in his house and he leaves jars of brand new unopened jars of peanut butter out, out in, a, in a basket up high. And then he'll come into the kitchen a couple hours later and the jar of peanut butter will be sitting on his table empty <laughs> with the cap screwed back on. 
And, uh, you know, he'll just have all this phenomena. And so um, I thought, well, how interesting that this person that I've had no contact with for 50 years, I'm suddenly having contact with again. And he said, well, the Sasquatch is a great gatherer. And then he told me that a woman in the group that lives like somewhere in Missouri or someplace like that, one day writes to the group and says, my, my little girl had a little pile of toys that she was playing with and they suddenly vanished. Does anybody know where they are? And he walks into his kitchen and there on his kitchen table were in Tennessee was a pile of the toys that this girl had had mis- disappeared from a completely different state. So he takes a picture and sends it to the woman that says, are these your daughter's toys? She said, yes, those are the toys. So that's why I just have a firm belief that reality is not what we think it is and that we're all interconnected. And it may be through a network of neural programming of some sort. You know, it, it may be. So that's why things that we think are real and tangible may not be. And we do know, even from a scientific standpoint, that any solid object is really a swarming mass of molecules, you know? Absolutely. <laughs> In the Einstein episode, listeners, uh, you know, we mentioned the quote from Einstein that goes somewhere along the lines of the fact that that physical matter is really just energy con- sort of concentrated down into a visible form so we can work with it. Um do you have any other stories of where you were remote viewing something quite conventional and you came across an interdimensional being, whether embodied or not, for that for that matter? Yes. Um I was paid, I was done a I, I did a paid project and um an organization asked me to remote view the origin of a photograph that was supposedly taken on Mars. And it was an experience like no other, and it really changed my life, this session. So I had no idea what the target was. I was totally blind to it. And I think I was, the only information I was given was the target is the location described the target. So and you hadn't seen the photograph? No. No, no. Viewers need to be totally blind to the target. They have need to have no idea. Yeah, yeah. So I had no idea. I didn't know what I was viewing at all. Um, but I, as I began the session, I was at that time in my life, I was, um, I believe I was like 51, maybe, but I was still having hot flashes. <laughs> I was having a lot of hot flashes at that time. And I was doing the session in my husband's parents' home because they lived in the same city with my mentor. And I was helping my mentor at the time with the class. So I was staying the night with my, excuse me, with my in-laws. And so they they were very old and they never turned on the air conditioning. And I was just like, really hot. And all of a sudden, instantly, I knew I was on Mars. I just had this almost a bilocation experience. I was suddenly on, I knew I was off planet and it was so bitterly cold that I knew that if I were physically there, I wouldn't survive because the cold was so intense. And I had the sense that I was millions of years in the past, that I was not in, in at present time. And that it was exceedingly cold and that the winds were very fierce. And uh, and so my lips turned blue and my teeth were chattering. And my husband had to go wrap me up in a blanket. And I didn't know what I was viewing. Really, you know, I all I knew was that I, you know, this was this phenomenon was affecting me physically. And I and I said, okay, I wanna, I wanna quit. I wanna stop. And so my husband, who was quite intrigued by everything I had gotten up to that point, and the fact that my lips were blue and I my teeth were chattering and that five minutes earlier, I had been sweating and wanting them to turn on the air conditioner. He said, okay, well, um, how about, because the monitor's job is never to ex- to control the session. Don't the view lead the chair. subject. Don't lead the right. subject. So, that, so, um, and so my husband was like, um, okay, well, how about if we just take a break instead of quitting? How about if we take a break and we go have dinner and go for a walk and then you can come back and resume the session? So I said, okay. And then when we came back and we resumed, um, I, I found myself in a circle of what looked like obelisks, like Washington Monument type obelisks, and they were set in a circle. And uh, so my husband asked me if I would move to the top of one of the obelisks. So I moved up to the top and he asked me what if I could determine what the purpose was. And I said, it's designed to both transmit and receive information. So then he said, move to that which is transmitting to it and describe. Instantly, I was in a totally different environment that was in a totally different dimension. And this, you have to understand that this was way outside of my normal 
(laughs) experiences, thought processes, belief systems, suddenly I'm just in this void, a big white void. And in front of me, very difficult to see, almost like I'm looking through water, were these three beings that were rather shapeless and a beautiful color of, of blue, like a turquoise azure type of blue that just kind of a glowing blue and they just emitted love like the love was overwhelming and they were communicating to me in a way that didn't involve language but i had this sudden understanding of everything they were saying and basically what they were transmitting to me was a concern for the planet for this planet and a concern for how we were treating the planet and what was going to become of the planet so to speak and they also i I came to understand that they would communicate with anyone who was open to hearing from them and so um after that i would stumble upon reading a book or something where the author suddenly explains an experience that was just like that with these three blue beings that were transmitting and the same messages and everything and i was amazed but then i got a call from the person who was paying me to do the project and i had written a, a, a report to something to send in, but it was very carefully worded because I was like, this is bizarre. And, you know, and I'm getting paid for this and, you know, how, I, how do I explain this part of it? You know, the rest of it, I've gotten tons of other information that was really concrete, but then this part of it seemed really esoteric. And I was kind of concerned that the person paying me would be like, you know, wait a minute, what is this? You know, <laughs> So, so um, they call and they say, Hey, um, Mel Riley would like to speak to you. He wants you to call him. Now, Mel Riley was the very first soldier inducted into the unit when it was first formed. And he was the only guy in the unit that served two tours of duty in the unit. Uh, In the history of the unit, he was the only person to serve two tours of duty. And so I'm thinking, Mel Riley wants to talk to me? Why? Why does Mel Riley want to talk to me? So I call him with great trepidation, wondering what he wants to tell me. And he said, "Um, you didn't know this, and I didn't know this, but we were both viewing the same target. I was also hired to view this target and he said so i want you to tell me what happened in your session and i won't want you to hold anything back i want you to really tell me what happened so i told him and and he started finishing my sentences because he had had the same exact experience and he said lori this was not a normal session we were both communicated with we were both being communicated with and the exact same thing happened to him which you know amazed me because this was this was an experience. This wasn't just ordinary remote viewing. It was an experience that defies explanation for me. And uh, and it was exactly what you asked me to, you know, do I have an example of is, you know, going into a totally different dimension. And that's happened to me on a number of remote viewing sessions where I've experienced a totally different dimension. And um, so I was, I was pretty blown away by that. And then since then, Anyone that I've given, and I've given this this target of this photograph of Mars. It's, it's a small little photograph of the orange dirt of Mars with a rather odd track in it. I've given this photograph as a target to a number of top-notch, world-class remote viewers who they started out as students of mine, and they all had the same exact experience to the point where they had tears running down their face at the emotion that was, you know, that came from it. And, and with one viewer, I asked, um, how did, you know, uh, how did these obelisks come to be? And she said they were grown by crystals in a lab. And I was just like, man, you can't make this stuff up. I mean, like, <laughs> she said they were grown like, like crystals in a lab. And I thought, what an amazing thing, you know, and she was blind to the target. She didn't know what she was viewing. You and know, presumably had, this I, triangulation, this asking several viewers to to look at the same target independently, this is something that presumably is quite often used to try and get sort of something to be slightly more verifiable. There's less margin of error if it's verifiable in that way. Is that triangulation something that, you, that you've that you used in the past? It's, is that something that was used in the military? Because I know that Hyman was critical of that in the report, that there wasn't enough of this triangulation. Well, here's the thing. We, I, I have found that, like, I, I think I've had seven or eight viewers view that target, and we all have the exact same experience of finding these obelisks and experiencing this, these beings and everything. Wow. And the same message came through. But what some there's controversy about that because there's the idea that there could be um, 
there could be analytical overlay in the sense that, right, if there's a mind connection, are we just reading each other's minds and experiencing the same thing? Mm-hmm. Um, and But yet it's such a powerful emotional experience that it's, you know, and I asked Mel a lot of, Mel and I became best friends. He became my best friend over the years. And I was so sad when he passed away. But Mel, um, you know, I said, Mel, what do you, th-? at one point there was a, a big target that we were all going to work on. And it had to do with a missing, some missing planes that had flown out of Madison, Wisconsin, the Air Force Base there. The, the, what happened was the Air Force Base had seen this blip on the radar and they didn't know what it was. So they, they scrambled a jet to go intercept the blip and they watched the jet on the radar coming to the blip. And then there was, then they just blink and it, and everything disappeared. There was nothing on the radar. So they scrambled another jet to go try to find what happened. And, uh, and I believe the other jet also disappeared. So, and there was no debris, you know, there was nothing. And so I was a viewer blind cast on that target. And, um, and I, you know, it was, it was a, it was a, it was great. We, you know, I drew this thing and everything. And then also Mel was also a, t- a viewer on that target. And then we ended up doing a joint presentation on that whole project for a conference. And uh, I think that's, we really, really became close friends over this. But the, the idea though, I said to Mel though, how, if, you know, you and I both found the same, we drew there, there was interesting designs on the jets. They weren't just normal silver jets. They were silver jets with these kind of black sharks on them. Uh, that were on the nose and they and we drew that you know in our sketches and um when they flew they were flying over um lake you know the great lakes and so you know that's a vast area you know it's almost like an ocean inside the united states and canada and it's so big and there's off there's been a lot of boats that have sunk and ships that have sunk because in certain times of the year it's extremely dangerous to fly over the great lakes or to be in a boat on the Great Lakes. And November, I understand, is a particularly dangerous time. And that's when all this happened. So the, uh, but in in viewing these things together and having the same experiences, you know, I was like, how much chances there that there's, you know, that we are connecting and and picking up on each other's sessions. And he, and, and we were going to go fly with a bunch of viewers to this one area and all share our information and, you know, that kind of a thing and view together and Mel just loved that when we would do that. And he said, well, here's what I found is that especially if you have a project where you have a number of viewers that are not in any way connected, they don't know who the other viewers are, and they're all spread out all over the world working on a project together, there's a lot less chance of that type of overlay occurring than if you're sitting at a table all together viewing. You know? um, and it's kind of like the psychic equivalent of the kid in the math class looking at the smart kids work during the test, you know. <laughs> <laughs> if you were working with, if you were sitting next to someone you really respected, like Joe McMonagall sitting next to me, am I going to psychically peek at what he's viewing because I know he's such a great viewer? You know what I mean? Um, and so that's the that's a theory. They don't know for sure if that happens. But even, so it's if, a it, theory. even if it does, it's still a psi phenomenon and therefore still very interesting, even if it is. But separating the two can definitely be difficult. Listen, Laurie, uh, we could keep sharing these extraordinary stories forever. And I must uh, just point the viewers to all of the brilliant, brilliant interviews with Laurie out there where she is as generous as she has been with us, with her time, with her knowledge um, and and with her love. You know, you're just shining that extraordinary love, Laurie. So um, readers do, if you're interested to do this, do go on to Intuitive Specialists, which is the website that Laurie runs with her with her husband. Do buy her book, Boundless, your how-to guide to practical remote viewing. And most importantly, get yourself onto a course and go out and try this. I'm tempted myself. I'm tempted myself if I'm not too busy uh, pumping out more and more content for you guys. Um, All that remains really, Laurie, is to say (laughs) thank you so much. You just, uh, it's exactly... I I just want your listeners to know that there is a free course on my website. It's free. It's completely free. It's a four-part uh, class. We call it the four-part master class. It's an introductory course to practical remote viewing. And I made it free because I want people to be able to try it and experience it. Just like Russell Targ would say, you, you don't believe it? Sit down and try it yourself. I wanted them to have that experience so that's that they brilliant. could try it themselves. And that's the purpose of the class. So the, anybody, any of your viewers can can see it. It's on our website at intuitivespecialist.com. And there's an S at the end of specialists. It's plural. So intuitivespecialist.com. You can get that free class. And that'll be in the show notes as well. 
Laurie Williams, thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, I wish you all the best in the future. Thank you so much, Freddie. It was great to be here. 